Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Donia Human Center lecture. My name is Kyoteru Tsutsui, and I'm the director of the Donia Human Center. It's a pleasure to welcome Ms. Wei Wei Niu to our um, lecture series here. She is currently the um, Obama Foundation Scholar at Columbia University, and she founded and directed uh, two important non-governmental organizations, the Women Peace Network and the Yangon Youth Center. Uh, her life story is part of the lecture, so I'm not gonna say too much about it, but um, she was a um, um, young, talented, promising college student at the age of, late teenager, and um, her life was abruptly interrupted uh, when the um, Myanmar government arrested her and uh, pretty much all of her close family members and imprisoned them, um, and her college life was interrupted for seven years. And she came back strong. She actually used the um, experience in, in uh, prison as uh, what she called University of Life. And she learned a lot from fellow inmates. And she used her experiments, experience to um, advocate for human rights in Myanmar, uh, women's rights, peace, democracy, justice, all of those things, and she has accumulated a lot of uh, accolades and honors. I'm not going to list all of them, but BBC 100 Women, Top 100 Global Thinkers by Foreign Policy Magazine, uh, 100 Inspiring Women by Salt Magazine, The Next Generation Leaders by Time Magazine, the Hillary Clinton Award from Georgetown University, World Economic Forum's Young Global Leader, uh, and she was also a visiting scholar with the University of Michigan's uh, Center for the Education of Women here. Some of uh, people from there might be here. Um, and it's a privilege to have her here to talk about the Rohingya crisis as it's unfolding before our eyes today and her personal uh, and professional engagement with uh, that crisis. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Ms. Wei Wei Nu. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you for joining today. And I would just have to thanks to the Human Rights Center. I don't want to mispronounce. I'm not going to pronounce your name. <laughs> um, uh, and Professor Keo and all other sponsor for today's event. And it's a privilege to be here. Uh, I think it's my third time in an hour. And I uh, had a, I gave a speech like uh, a lecture last year uh, with the CEW class and then I uh, you know spent with them during the summer it was I kind of fell in love with the city and it's really convenient small um, nice city people are really friendly and with the campus so I'm really happy to be back here for one day <laughs> um, uh, so yeah it's, it's a privilege and thank you everyone for joining uh, so before I start my lecture, do you, I, I want to ask a few questions. Uh, how many of you are from Myanmar? No, nobody, right, okay. How many of you have been to Myanmar? Uh, yes, yes, a couple. How many of you are doing work on Myanmar? Like in your research, in your study, how many of you? Yes, how many of you are interested in Myanmar? <laughs> I guess all, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's wonderful to know that's why you're here, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, let's go to deeper. Um, do you know this picture? If you like, do you, do you but you watch Hollywood movie, right? Do you remember in any movie, do you see this, this picture? Can you guess what is the picture? Yeah? Boat. Yeah, it's a boat. It's... Yeah, everybody is swimming. It's right. not the Poseidon adventure. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's look like a Hollywood picture, like movie, right? picture in a Hollywood movie, but it's actually 
not a Hollywood movie, it's actually reality. It was three days ago when a group of Rohingya trying to leave, escape from the camps, and they were drawn. And 16 of them were dead and 50 were missing. And it's, it's a tragic. It's happening now. People are trying to escape from this, you know, brutal genocidal campaign in Myanmar. And they're trying to, they're seeking for a dignified life, human dignity and human life, a, a life that they want. So um, sometimes uh, for me, you know, it's, it's important that we talk about, I, I talk about the issue, the suffering of my people and my experience so that the world, with the hope that the world will take and act uh, accordingly so that we save life and we restored, restore human dignity and we give a life, human life to fellow human beings. But it's not really easy always, right? It's, it's really personal and it's who you are. So it's really, really difficult. However, it's my responsibility to share with you and I'm gonna share today. So let's go deeper. Um, so I kind of divided the uh, talk into three parts. First, uh, a bit of background of the Rohingya, who are the Rohingya, and uh, what happens to them, and the political climate of Burma, Myanmar, and perhaps how can we fix it at the end, right? So, as you may, as many of you may know, the Rohingya are um, a predominantly Muslim majority, Muslim ethnic group, um, reside, live in the northern part of, western part of Burma in Rakhine State uh, for many, many years. But the government of Myanmar refused, denied their existence in the state and um, framed them as outsiders or alien of the country. Uh, but in the history, before it's become Burma, Myanmar, as a country, the Rohingya and Rakhine, the Buddhist and Muslim populations in Rakhine state have to coexisted for thousands of years. And even after uh, it's, uh, it was conquered by the Burmese and it's become um, Burmese uh, state in 1970, uh, 1875 and 1875 to 18, uh, okay, 1875. Uh, since then, the Rohingya also lived with the Buddhist, fellow Buddhist communities together in many, many uh, times. Uh, but the campaign, the brutal, brutal campaign against the population has created distrust between the community and hate among the community. So the Burma was under the British colony from 1885 to 1948. And it was you know, British rule as part of India. Burma was part of India during the British colony. Um, and Burma got independence in 1948. And we had 10 years of parliamentary uh, system from 1948 to actually not 10 years, more than 10 years, 1962 when we had a military coup by a military leader in 1962. Within this parliamentary democracy period, the Rohingya were full citizens and recognized as ethnic indigenous population of the country. And uh, since 1961 to 65 actually, uh, they were given uh, like a special um, the uh, status, like they were uh, the, the 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 area that Rohingya lived uh, in northern Rakhine. They have a separate administration uh, policy or administration process from the central government. Therefore, it was the Rohingya area was uh, named as a special administration zone. So in those even in that period, uh, there were equal. The Rohingya was regarded as 
the indigenous ethnic populations of the country and treat it as equal citizens. And they hold the same identity card as other fellow Burmese. Um, so according to the 1948 Citizenship Act, they, there were national registration cards. So the national registration card meant for the national citizens and the majority of the Rohingya, 98% of the Rohingya were issued the card. So all of them were basically citizens. And um, the persecution has started from 1977-78. The military regime, the General Nguyen's government, carried out this operation called Nagamin. In English, it's kings of, king of dragons um, operation process. Uh, through this process, this process actually aimed to inspect uh, individuals in the country, especially in Rakhine State, in Northern Rakhine State, uh, to designate you know, whether they are citizens or foreigner. Although they obtained, 98% of Rohingya obtained full citizenship card and re regard as uh, both citizens of the country. And along, along with this campaign, he has launched uh, this very uh, brutal activities with, by deploying military that involve killings, arbitrary arrests, requisitions of houses, and rapes, all of these severe, um, brutal uh, acts uh, by the military, uh, members of military, that let about 200,000 people fled Bangladesh, become refugee. So when you see the world's largest refugee crisis today where one million refugees are living in Bangladesh in the world largest refugee camp, it's not just happened today, it's not accidental. It's been carried out over time, it's, it's a result of inaction. So it's happened in 2000, uh, 1978. Luckily at that time, because this Rohingya hold national ID card, uh, NRC, they were able to return to Myanmar with the facilitations of UNHCR. So majority of the refugee were able to return. And the general Nguyen has to need to come up with a more strategic plan to drive these people out. Therefore, he come up with the idea of new citizenship law, which has a greater focus on the ethnic belonging only when you are registered or recognized ethnic nationality groups, you will be a both citizen. And in the citizenship law, it's called 1982 citizenship law, it also has like classes of citizenship status. So some were both citizen and naturalized citizens, associate citizens, and uh, you know, foreigners. Uh, so it has a classes of citizens. And along with the citizenship law, he, come up, he came up with, in 1983, uh, he came up with the list of nationality group. So which exclude the Rohingya, which didn't include Rohingya anymore. So that, that's mean the Rohingya are automatically a strip of from their birth citizenship rights. They are no longer a birth citizenship because they're not in the list of 135 groups, which is required for the citizenship, according to the citizenship law, to have a birth, birth citizenship status. So they become basically de facto, uh, like, uh, like uh, uh, legally, uh, actually, um, uh, non birth citizen in the country, in their own place. And in 1989, there was a nationwide uh, national uh, identification card process. So they were basically renewing old card to issuing new card. In that conditions, the Rohingya's old ID card, which is NRC, were seized or you know, revoked. 
and they were issued with new, introduced after a few years, they were introduced with a new form of card, which is called white card, or because it's white, or it's, in other words, a temporary registration card. Mean, if you are, if you're holding temporary registration card, um, you're not clear whether you are citizens or not. So they, they started to issue this white card around 1994-95 um, until, and they were holding, they, they were forced to hold the card, TRC, until 2014 when it was revoked as well. Eventually Rohingya remain with no documentation now. So throughout this period from 1990, um, so it started from 1998, 1989, 1990, 1991, uh, 92, 93 to 2000 um, up to today. So the military government has introduced very um, strategic discriminatory policies against the Rohingya population, which include the restrictions on the birth rate. What does that mean is you can only have two children. If you have more than two children, whether you will be punished or sent to prison for five years, or and your children will not be issued, will not be issued like birth registration card or uh, will not be added in the family um, family registration card. Mean the kid, these children doesn't exist anymore. They don't exist. According to the UNHCR, uh, in 2013, there was about 60,000 they call blacklisted children. Mean they were born out of this uh, restrictions or um, the, uh, the 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 policy. And the restrictions on marriage. So, so unlike any other Burmese ethnic groups, the Rohingya are required to get the permission to marry. And it's, it cannot, you cannot just go to an office and get permission. It has lots of like bureaucratic processes and procedure, and it's required bribe as well. You can only get permissions if you bribe in different offices and offices. So that means they have uh, strategically trying, uh, tried to limit the marriage of the Rohingya population among the Rohingya families. So the poor, because of all these other restrictions and uh, discriminations against the population, they become very poor, right? So the poor cannot pay bribe and you know, it's not easy for them to get the permission. So the part that they choose at the end is sending their daughters to a foreign country. And most of the time they end up uh, you know, having uh, been trafficked or ha facing all this tragedy. Or in worst cases, they can be drawn like that. And that has been the practice for about more than 25 years. So that's one way. If uh, if, so if you choose to marry without permission, whether you go to five years of jail or you pay like you know tens of thousands of money to 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 to, to, to the authorities and you escape the uh, punishment. So that's that that was one policy. And education. So before 1989, among Rohingya, we have doctors, we have lawyers, we have professors, we have police officers, we have mayors, governors. We had uh, my own, my own, like great grandfather. Uh, uh, he's still alive, a grandfather, uh, not real grand, but the, the extended grandfather. Uh, he was in the in in the army for his entire life, and. Um, and since 1989, they have uh, imposed this policy that the gradually they remove all the public servants from the, from the public offices, including my father. My father was a school teacher, a headmaster for 30 years. And they were he was resigned from uh, his office with the accusation that he got involved in um, uh, illegal 
um, political activities, you know, when he kind of like get involved in 1988 revolution, student revolution as founded teachers union, and it's become a crime and he was resigned. So they find um, like excuses to revoke or you know, remove the Rohingya public servants from their offices. And moreover, the Rohingya students are not allowed to go to the universities across Myanmar. Um, and if you're lucky enough, you can go to the, uh, there is a university in Rakhine State, only one university. If you're wealthier enough, if you're lucky enough, you are uh, good with, if you have a good relationship with the authorities, you can go to the Sidri University, which is the only available university in that state. Uh, state. And you can go to the university, but yet, if you're great, you can, you are only access, uh, you know, uh, uh, you will be only admitted to the uh, so-called non-professional subjects. For example, you're not going to be admitted to law school or engineer or doctors. You will, you can only take um, the subject like, um, for example, English, Burmese. Uh, in Myanmar, if you take these subjects in the university, you won't get any job at the end. So that's the limitation that Rohingya students have access to for in terms of education. Even then, if you're graduated, they won't issue you the degree certificate, the diploma. And it's not just only true to Rakhine State. They have actually introduced that to the other part of Burma, including non-Rohingya. So in my case, I grew up in Rangoon, in, um, which is the, the city, it used to be the capital of Burma. And as Kyo said, my education was interrupted when I was second year uh, college student. When I came out, I finished the rest of two years, the, 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 the other two years. And when I was graduated, I thought I, have, I will have a different experience. So I was, um, you know, I was well prepared and I put up my makeup and my dress and I was so happy. I was actually in, um, in New York. It was in November, I remember 27th. It was in the time of General Assembly. I came to do advocacy, it was in 2013. I came to do advocacy at the UN headquarter. And I went back on 27th, I arrived in the morning because I was so oh, excited about convocation, right? And, and I dressed up and I went there with my family. My mom and my dad was so ha were so happy because, you know, they see this, they, they, this, they, 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 they finally experienced that their daughter uh, would be, uh, will be graduating. Um, and they suffered so much when we were arrested because they thought they destroy our future, right? Uh, because of their political uh, activities. So my father was so particularly so happy to see this thing happening. And I was on the stage and I received the diploma and I took a few steps, I realized it was not a diploma. It says, go and inquire um, at the office. You know, go and come to the office. And it was just a white paper and it, it, it written like that. It's in Yangon, like in Yangon University, the biggest and the most the prominent university in Myanmar. And I was so like shocked and I couldn't even take another step. And I didn't know what was happening. And I went to the office and they said, your ID card is not eligible to get the diploma. It was, it was mind blowing. I was like, so why did you allow me to study for four years? Why did you waste my time? It was Dean I remember. Why did you admit me from the first place, right? Um, and I was asking her questions. She seemed to be like about 50 years or something. And I know she would have uh, uh, hold this, the same idea as I had. And I said, what about you? When you are graduated, do you, didn't you have the same idea as me? And she said, yes. You got your diploma, right? And she said, yes. But why didn't, can you give me? And she said, it's the policy, I can't do anything. You can talk to the ministry. 
So I went back and so just sharing. It was not just in Rakhine State. It was not because in Yangon, it was not because, uh, I mean, it was not literally because I'm Rohingya, but because the ID card that I hold, because I'm Rohingya, uh, I didn't get out. I, I, I don't have access to the latest versions of ID card. And I choose not to anyway. Uh, so it's happening. It's happening even now, right? It was not the past, actually. Um, so it was education. And now, since 2012, uh, Rohingya students have no access to university at all. And I can't imagine how painful will be all the students in the IDP camps, in the villages, when they finish matriculation, all the youth, you know, have a dream to go to the university, pursue their life. It was heartbreaking when I was in the prison, when I had to stop my education. I misses my school, my friends, and you know, my future. I want to finish my degree. I want to have a future like others, right? It was so painful uh, for me, and I can't imagine how the, these kids in Rakhine today is feeling. And in some cases, they see the university next to their camps because the camp is in the middle of the, uh, the university is in the middle of the city, yet they still don't have access to education for seven years. So, yeah, let's move on to the health. <laughs> Uh, for the health, it's the same in many cases. Um, the patients said there has been report by the NGOs and pay, uh, the individuals that the hospital, government hospital, uh, basically give the expired um, medicine, medications, and treat them very discriminatory way. And um, in most cases, they can't go to the hospital because it is very far from their village and they don't have any document to go to the hospital, even if they have documents, what happens is you have to pass all these checkpoints. So you need to get permissions, just like in Israel and Palestine. You know, if you want to get the access to the hospital, you need to get this permission, permit system. So it's the same in Rakhine State for the Rohingya. If you want to go to the hospital or big cities or big markets, you need to get the permission. So that's the uh, and most of the time, people don't have money to get the permission because it's, the permit doesn't come easily. You have to pay bribe any, for everything. So a lot of the people um, have lack access to the health care for generation. And religious practices like, you know, we're not allowed to build mosques or uh, gather uh, freely. And employment uh, and economic opportunities. So the Rohingya are no longer given uh, permission to for big businesses or uh, you know tender or all of this uh, all this opportunity has gone to the Rakhine po Buddhist Rakhine populations and freedom of movement as I said this uh, permission uh, they are required to have citizenship card if you don't have citizenship card you need to get this permission uh, wherever you go and even with this permission you cannot go beyond Rakhine state or beyond your city it's extremely difficult. That's how they concentrated the population for three decades. And it's still ongoing. So, um, you know, just um, you know, right before this persecution has started, I should have put this slide earlier than this. Uh, but anyway, uh, we had uh, an election in 1990, uh, in 1990 and where the Aung San Suu Kyi, which current leader of our country, uh, won landslide. And, um, and military failed to deliver the, transfer the power to the, uh, to, the, to the winning parties and crack down uh, politicians and political parties. So this is when my father was targeted too. He was an elected parliamentarian in the election and he was targeted, he was put in jail in 1991. And, um, and then he moved to Yango uh, to avoid the, um, the uh, imprisonment or, 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 or jail. And alongside with that, there was another, another um, wave of 
suppressions and, and operations against the Rohingya population. It says, it's called Hinta, Hinta operation. So it was the same as Dragon, Nagamin operations. At that time, it was also, again, about 250,000 people fled to Bangladesh and they were able to return. I mean, not all of them, the like majority of them were able to return. When they returned to Myanmar, this time they're not given citizenship card anymore. Instead, they were given uh, this well, temporary card or white card. And alongside with that, the military uh, introduced this very repressive military dictatorship um, and introduced divide and rule policies against different ethnic groups. So my father moved to Yangon at that time. And, uh, and I was, I think I was eight or nine years old. And I grew up in Yangon. I went my um, primary school, middle school, and high school in, uh, in Yangon. Yeah. Um, so I avoided immediate discriminations in Rakhine, where Yangon has, you know, like less discriminations in compared with Rakhine. However, I have been hearing all these situations from my uh, family members, from my grandparents, from, from my aunties and uncles and cousins, how their life has been difficult. So my father later on joined Aung San Suu Kyi um, in a political ally, uh, alliance. Uh, it's called Committee Representing People Parliament, which is 18 political leaders across the country come together uh, to basically um, to, 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 to get rid of the military, uh, to take the parliament. And the military targeted the group. So we were arrested in 2005. Um, my father was arrested in March 2005. And after two months later, they came and arrest the rest of the family members. We never thought that we will be targeted or arrested uh, because we didn't do anything. We didn't commit any crimes or my family is very simple family. We don't even engage any criminal or even like minor criminal activities. We don't. So it was really shocking uh, when they take away, take us away and put us in the jail. And, and it was so I, we realized it was not just because my father's political activities, but also because we were Rohingya. We are Rohingya. So, um, yeah, it was it was really the prison life was not easy. Not like perhaps not like in in U.S. You don't get a good food or clean water or you don't get sandwich. You know, you get like really dirty rice and uh, soup without salt or anything. Uh, and it was really dire living condition. Emotionally, the most difficult part was, as I said, you know desire to stop going to university, desire for, for future, for dreams, desire to, um, to basically uh, to release, to be free, and desire to free from be being treated as criminals, although you don't commit any crimes. And when I see the prison stuff, guts, it's always, it's, it's, it's very difficult, and I, 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 I I didn't hate them, but I, I really didn't like them the way they treat. And it, it instigate my anger all the time, the way they tr see me and they see us. Um, and, and I always, in my mind, uh, you know, in, in, in the bottom of my heart, I know that I'm not guilty. I am not a criminal. So it was really, really difficult. And and the most, uh, one of the most difficult part was that they not only you know put us in jail, they kind of separate our family. They took away my father, I transferred my father to very far prison, and we thought we're not gonna see him forever. So I was very close to my dad, and it was a tragic uh, moment because it was at that time he was like sixty-five or so. And he was sentenced for 47 years, while we were sentenced uh, to for 17 years. Uh, you know, if he had to stay the entire prison terms, you know, he might not be alive. You know, by the time it ends, uh, his prison terms end. So we, it was really difficult when they um, transferred my father 
to other prison, and we didn't see him until we were released. So it's, it's, it's the most difficult part. Of, we didn't have any information about him for two years, and we didn't know where they put him. And um, I remember one day we received a letter from him after two years uh, saying he is okay. And I remember we hold, I hold my mom and my sister's hand, and we cried for about one hour. So the good thing, the good news is we had political transition in 2011. And about uh, um, 623 political prisoners were released, and it included us, too. It was in 2012, January 13th. Uh, so it's almost seven years, right? It's felt yesterday, actually. So we came out with the hope that we will be able to involve in the democratic transition and the people of Burma will be able to will enjoy the full uh, freedom and equality uh, that they always wanted, democracy. But it turned out to be very different than what we expected. It just last six months, the violence against my community has erupted in 2012 June with an incident uh, of rape uh, uh, against uh, Buddhist young Buddhist women by allegedly three Muslims. We still don't have the truth and the, the fair justice. And one of the boys who uh, were detained uh, suicide in the prison. So the truth is still unclear. What was that actually? And that invoked the violence and erupted this, this, this violence and resulted 125,000 people become IDPs. Many were killed. Many like basically fled the country. IDP means internally displaced person. I didn't put it here, but it's okay. It was in 2012. Uh, but since then, there was like uh, really in incentive, uh, uh, intensive propaganda against the uh, Rohingya population. So basically, you know, they are portrayed as, you know, rapists, uh, extremists, um, uh, you know, every bad things that can, uh, that is possible. And, you know, outsiders, illegal, all of these words are everywhere in the newspapers and in and TV, the campaign has intensified, and the Buddhist monks get involved, and the prominent Buddhist la leaders take a stand and like uh, come out of the street and protest against the Rohingya population to kill them, to drive them out, and all of this campaign has continued. And um, in 2014, there was a village in northern Rakhine State in Mondo. It's called Dutiaden. And there was um, the the there was uh, violence occurred, and many individuals from the village were killed, and many escaped, many were arrested, and since then the government tried to government started to withdraw uh, stuffs and sub supplies from the hospital because one of the reason was that um, the MSF Medicine Sons Frontier. Uh, Doctors Without Border, let's say, reported that the number of killed and injured people that they received after Duchir and even. So they limited, suspended MSF operations and withdraw uh, stuffs and sub supplies from the hospital, government hospital. So there was, uh, these are like some of the movement development that has happening over time. And in 2014, again, there was nationwide census uh, with the assistance, uh, collaborations with the UNICEF. The Rohingya were not included in the census because they refused to register as Bengali. So they were not included in the census. And, and also because they were like categorized as uh, forced, to ca forced to fill as in the foreigners column. So the Rohingya refused to take part at the end 
they were excluded from the nationwide uh, census and government introduced this verification card saying that you know you guys are illegal we have to verify them and then they started to issue this card called national verification card while um, they revoke a uh, former white temporary card and the card is basically this national verification card the many uh, Rohingya members um, called the card as genocidal card because that create the Rohingya as uh, non-citizen that legally you will become non-citizens once you hold this card and you will have to go through naturalization process uh, naturalized citizenship in Burma is different from naturalized citizen in US if in US if you're a naturalized citizen you can do anything apart from becoming a president but in Myanmar it's different if you're a naturalized citizen you have limited property rights you ha can vote you cannot run the office and your citizenship naturalized citizenship can be revoked anytime uh, if you quarrel with your neighbor and you it, it, it can be revoked so it's really like second class so Rohingya are refused to take it and call it as genocidal cut. It started from 2014 and it's ongoing until now. And in 2015 election, the military party actually uh, amended the po po political party laws, uh, say, says that you will be only able to vote with them, whether with a citizenship card or naturalized citizenship card. So who the white card white card holder or national whatever other card holders will not be able to vote so basically it's mean as a first time in the history of Burma Rohingya were dis disenfranchised and um, not just that the NLD party has uh, actually excluded Muslim candidates not just Rohingya general Muslim candidate from the elections so these are some of the uh, uh, development during the during the transition. So democracy meant to be, uh, uh, you know, participations, like including people and uh, voting. When you exclude the people, the weak, oh, the weakest one, and we cannot call it democracy anymore. But yet the world has uh, determined to support Burmese democracy and thought they can fix the problem of Rohingya when Burma become democracy. So we should isolate the case, the Rohingya, and we can fix it later, let's support Burma. And then the Aung San Suu Kyi become a uh, government the leader in 20, after 2015 election. The National League for Democracy, led by the Aung San Suu Kyi government, won the election. Although she become um, the government, her gov her, uh, she take a position as the head of the state, Actually, she didn't fix any of the problem that is happening since 2012. First of all, she, what she did, instead of like fixing the problem, what she did was, the first thing that she did was, was you cannot call the, Ro the name Rohingya because it's invoke the violence, uh, it's create hate. So you cannot call, use the name Rohingya. That's the policy that she adopted. And she didn't fix the uh, Mabata hate campaign, and um, and and then the military uh, carried out another clearance operations in 2016, uh, when a group of Rohingya, so-called Rohingya, I don't know, we don't know if they're Rohingya or not, attacked the military post in Rakhine, northern Rakhine, and um, with the name of counter attack. Uh, the military of Burma launched this clearance operations and that resulted uh, more than 100,000 people displaced basically become refugees in Bangladesh and 1,250 uh, 1, buildings uh, in five villages were burned down and many were killed the same stories and rape women were brutally raped and many were arrested the UN uh, Office of the High Commissioner report says it's likely amount to crimes against humanity. And the, the propaganda goes on and on. Uh, you know, those terrorist attack, this Islamists, you know, like 
uh, taking over the state and all of this propaganda on, uh, uh, has increased. Uh, the UN and humanitarian organization has no access to that area. I remember it was um, in, we were talking to US government and many other governments saying that you know, we should, ha we should uh, hold the perpetrators accountable. We should end these circles of impunity. So it's not just one time that the military is behaving in that way. They have done it before to other ethnic minorities in the history. And they're doing this to Rohingya again and again and targeting civilian and systematically like uh, cracking down the civil civilian populations and killing. So this is unacceptable under the name of democracy. We are, um, you know, ignoring this. It's, 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 it's unacceptable. We cannot achieve democracy with the blood and bone of Rohingya. That was the message. And all these government, including the White House, um, choose not to listen to us. And the White House, eventually on uh, November, lifted the sanctions against the Myanmar military. And along with that, as I said, the Mabata Buddhist nationalist movement uh, was like really hot and is still ongoing. There was active media propaganda by the state media and non-state media, disinformations and misinformations on the Facebook everywhere. And, um, and it's also uh, easier, you know, when there is misinformation, it's e easier for the, for the Burmese population to believe what, is, uh, what they see on the, on the media because um, for decades, for five decades, the, the country was closed and there wasn't communication and engagement between the ethnic groups. So they don't know each other. So there wasn't no interaction. So it's easier to, to believe what, the, what they see in the Facebook campaign, Facebook or media. And the education system for this five decades under military dictatorship, it's all about Burmese Buddhism. So Burmese Buddhism, superiority of the Burmese, how the, the country is owned by the Burmese, all of this. So when they see the Muslim group and, you know, uh, in, in the corner of the country next to the Bangladesh, which is highly populated, the Muslim, and they're claiming to be Burmese, they really believed what, the, what they see in the media propaganda as, you know, these people are uh, invading a country, intruders, uh, uh, their false claim, and we are really under threat of national security. At the same time, whatever happening in Rakhine State, or it's actually spread to the all part of Burma. In one case, in, in, a, in, in the middle of the Burma, in, it's in a city called Mektila, 34 uh, school children were burned alive in front of the whole town. And it's, it's include the members of Buddhist monks. It's heartbreaking. We used to believe the Buddhist monks are really, you know, we were taught by my, our parents, we cannot even like step on, on the image of like the Buddhist monk because it's a sin and it's not good and Buddhist monks are really, I mean, of course there are a lot of Buddhist monks, but this campaign has included Buddhist monks as well, unfortunately. And um, so this crime, even in, let alone in Rakhine State, in other part, the, the, the inner part of Burma, this happened, there's still no justice for this, uh, this, this, these crimes. And um, there is no rule of law, and judiciary is not uh, independent. Uh, it's, it's, it's highly controlled by the military leaders. And, and therefore, military is uh, immune, uh, given impunity for all of the crimes that has committed against all, other, uh, all ethnic communities across the country and the military control, as I said, until now under this democracy, they control major three major ministry, uh, home affair and uh, foreign affair, uh, not foreign affair, home affair, uh, the defense and the border, border, border ministry, 
Water Affair Ministry. So the major security sectors and administrations is under the military. At the same time, they have influence over the judiciary. And 25% of the parliamentary seats are reserved for the military. So basically, military still control a lot of the power. And there is no way that we can uh, gain justice through the judicial sector. And at the same time, constitutionally, military uh, were given um, uh, the, uh, the military court system, the martial, court marshals to the under the military. So mean, if a soldier involved or commit a crime, it, go, it can only be uh, perceived uh, through the uh, military court, which is under the military. So there is no way of holding militaries uh, accountable. And at the same time, there is leadership failure. As I said, it's not just about military. The civilian government failed to take actions and being complicit to this campaign um, and misguiding the people without, you know, when you say you're not, we, we can use the word Rohingya and people will think, yes, because it's wrong to use the word Rohingya, the name Rohingya. So therefore Rohingya are wrong what our leader is saying right. So that it's create more hate against the Rohingya population, the leadership. And, um, and, and the, the, uh, still now we don't have freedom of expressions. If you criticize whether government, civilian government or military, you will be uh, put in jail. We have more than 300 cases of um, uh, individuals uh, being charged under the defamation acts. Um, uh, so the, the, the suppressions of the uh, freedom of expressions is, is very severe, it's still there. So all of these factors enable the military to carry on a five times bigger, larger uh, campaign against the Rohingya population. So it's involved domestic political climate and international failure. And that's allowed the military to carry on this clearance operation. How many of you remember or watch or read the news in this time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was, yeah, a lot of you. So the 2017, uh, there was again, you know, conspiracy that the terrorist group Asa Arkan Rohingya Salvation Army has attacked 30 military posts and killed 30 military. We still don't have where, uh, locations and the dead bodies pictures. So with that, the military can uh, launch another clearance operations that resulted eight, eight, 85, 8, 85, how do I say that? 850,000 people <laughs> to become refu uh, becoming refugees and forcefully displaced. And 395 villages were burned. At least 10,000 people were killed, uh, according to some NGOs report and fact-finding mission report. And the, the campaign include the brutal usage of sexual violence, rape, gang rape, and mutilation. So basically, women in... in the women that I talk in the camps, the horror, it's, I have never read that kind of brutal uh, form of rape in the history at all. Um, it includes raping women as a group and bringing them to, a, to the, to the to a, a empty houses and rape them as groups and in, in very brutal manner, sometimes use their knives and weapons into the uh, women's bodies. And then at the end, if uh, when the house is full, they lock the door and they burn the houses. And a few female uh, escaped, and they share their uh, the, because the houses are like with built with uh, bamboos, right? So they can uh, whoever didn't uh, die, they can break the the bamboo uh, wall, and they uh, they can escape. Escape. So um, I met like at least two survivors in the camps and they share their stories. And it's, it's heartbreaking, the, the intensive brutality uh, uh, with, uh, by using sexual violence. 
um, and then arbitrary arrest and destructions of villages and, and land religious buildings and everything. And that's resulted the world's largest refugee camps in Bangladesh. So what is happening? After two years, since 2017 now, finally, um, we were able to get this uh, international um, um, like mechanisms to kind of to pursue the international justice processes. Um, as a first time, international fact-finding missions on Myanmar was formed at the UN Human Rights Council and their report, they, re they, they produced 440 page long report, um, you know, describing very details and brutal violations. And then uh, last year, the, oops, uh, the UN has actually formed um, the in international independent mechanisms on Myanmar. So actually the international independent mechanisms are uh, supposed to be forming since 2017 or 16, but because the, the diplomacy, the politics of the world uh, didn't allow us to get this at that point. So uh, the, the, the most we could get was the international fact-finding mission mean it didn't have any authority apart from collecting facts and putting together. So, but uh, however, they really did really good job and they come up with really good report and that allow to, uh, to that lead to the creations of international uh, independent uh, mechanisms, which has more mandate to collect uh, the evidence and to prepare a uh, legal case for future accountability processes. So this is really good thing. And this, ju this, ha this has just done it. So they are going to be operation operationalized soon. And um, yeah, and that's, that's, that's from the UN side. And then the, um, with the leadership of Islamic, um, organizations of Islamic cooperations, OIC, the Gambia, the small country from the Africa, has taken initiative to file a lawsuit against Myanmar in ICJ, International Court of Justice. So the ICJ has recently ruled, um, um, uh, provide the orders on provisional measures for Myanmar to abide for provisional measures that include um, to prevent the, uh, any act of uh, genocidal act by taking all necessary measures to preserve uh, uh, evidences of genocide and to report in three months and four months and then every six months periodically. So that's in ICJ uh, process. And ICC also has actually taken its own initiative, although it doesn't have a jurisdiction over Myanmar because Myanmar is not a party to Rome statute. They have taken their own initiative to investigate now. So they are investigating crimes against humanity um, uh, on the crimes of forced deportation. So because the Rohingya were forcefully deported to Bangladesh, so they are, they are taking their own, the, their, their, their investigation is ongoing. And at the same time, um, um, the, there is the universal jurisdictions file in Argentina, uh, led by Rohingya organizations in UK and some lawyers. So these are like development after all of this suffering and, and tragedy, tragedies. Yet things hasn't actually changed. The military, as I said, it's continue getting impunity from the public and in the, uh, by the domestic uh, justice system. And at the same time, there is intensifications of civil war between the Rakhine army, Arkan army, which is uh, a dominant Buddhist group in Rakhine state where Rohingya live, Arkan army and the Myanmar military. So the, during the fighting, it's happening every day even now, the Rohingya has been victimized twice by both parties and they, uh, they've been targeted and they're using the Rohingya villages mostly as their battlegrounds and it's actually war crimes, right? And at the same time, the Burmese government is still uh, not allowing humanitarian agencies and uh, to, to access to the, to the uh, conflict affected area. Basically, the Gambia lawyers uh, and the ICJ said 
it's a form of deprivations of food. So they're basically systematically depriving the food and nutrition of the Rohingya so that they cannot survive. And at the same time, healthcare. As I said, the healthcare is extreme. There is only one doctor for about 300,000 people in Northern Rakhine State, one official doctor at, by the government hospital. Uh, even for that, it's extremely difficult to get access to, the, to that hospital. And there, if there is no NGO and INGOs, then there is no health care. My grandma is 86 years old. She doesn't have access to health care. She doesn't have medication. It's now. It's now. So it's, it's, it's happening. It's ongoing. And, um, and there is no in independent media and investigators are allowed at UN agencies, UN investigations. In, uh, the fact-finding missions or IIIM are not allowed to go to the uh, affected area. And the, all other practices against the Rohingyas are ongoing, including the employment opportunity, mean they cannot even go and fish in the river next to them. And they can be shot or killed, or they can be um, extorted if they go. Even like the, the river next to them, or even to their farm um, next to their home or village, let alone like doing big businesses or, you know, getting job. There is no economic opportu uh, employment opportunities as well. And the government, the Myanmar, uh, the, the Dong San Suu Kyi is still denying to use the name Rohingya. And at the same time, this genocidal cut processes is ongoing. So all of these factors create the Rohingya uh, life, um, you know, cause them to basically to unable to live as a, as a human, uh, to exist in that uh, area. So that's become a form of forced, uh, like, deportations or, you know, basically push factor, or you just die. And it has been ongoing for two, since 2012. So the, uh, as I said, the Burmese government, uh, um, there is no domestic justice system that we can hold perpetrators accountable or we can change government behavior. And Myanmar government actually, because of the, all the pressures from the international communities, they have actually conducted eight investigations and none of them found human rights violations. And lately, the last one, uh, the government led this independent commissions of inquiry after the um, ICJ's uh, case uh, occurred uh, after the filing of genocide, um, LH genocide violations at the ICJ by the Gambia, this commission has come up with a report saying that, yes, there were some incidents of crimes against humanity, but it's not a genocide. So, so that's a development. Um, as I said, the military, uh, there is no way that we can hold military accountable there because the military a court is not under civilian government. So what's come next? So we have elections in 2020. And uh, so the question, the big question is whether the uh, NLD behavior will, be, will change or not, whether they will re-enfranchise the Rohingya or not, whether they will repeal citizenship law and other um, discriminatory policies or not, um, and whether they will comply with the ICJ's uh, ruling on provisional measures or not, you know, whether the refugees will be able to return or not, uh, whether Rohingya citizenship rights will be re uh, restored or not. And those are really big questions for next year, uh, for this year and next year, 2020 is the next. So, and this is only rely on all of us effort. So basically we need to do more awareness, more consistent advocacy, we need to call for the action sanctions against the perpetrators of these crimes, and we need to continue seek justice and criminal accountability for the victims and survivors, so that these circles of impunity will end. When this circle of impunity will end, we will see a hope, and we will be able to move forward or push for the policy change in the in the in back home. So that's all. Thank you very much.